Bonjour, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry I will speak in English. I don't know your beautiful language in French, so I have to do this in English. Uh, my name is uh, Philippe Saboya. I'm executive manager at Atos Institute in Brazil. Uh, we're the largest CSR organization in Brazil, and uh, amongst other topics, uh, diversity is one of our main agendas. That's why I'm here, uh, especially in Brazil, due to a lot of inequality issues. This is a very important subject. We'll have a lot to talk about here. Uh, but this morning, my, my job is to be a moderator uh, so and hand the floor to the inspiring women here. Uh, we wanted to start this session a bit differently. Uh, Isabel put this idea to uh, get questions from the audiences before. Uh, so we can speak, the women here can speak based on your thoughts, your ideas, your interests, and so on. So I wanted to ask you, why are you here? We have a crowded house here. Why are you here? Why do you think uh, this is an important topic in 2017? Uh, why do you think, uh, what are your main interests, what are your main doubts, what are your main questions regarding uh, the subject of gender equity and women empowerment? Feel free, I hand you the microphone. It can be in French, in English. Why are you here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe I'll start. So uh, my name is Evelyn Astor. I work for the International Trade Union Confederation. So we represent um, the interests of organized labor uh, with the, in the ILO processes, UN, et cetera. Uh, and we're very interested, obviously, in issues around gender equality in the workplace and the kinds of policies that can be uh, employed by governments, but also by uh, enterprises in facilitating women's greater participation and advancement in the labor market. And the question that I would really like to ask, well, maybe to say why, why we should be concerned about this. Um, we see that women are uh, more and more qualified. In Europe, they're outpacing men in terms of educational achievement, but they remain considerably underrepresented. And we see that a lot of this has to do with the distribution between work and care, that the employment rates are more or less the same, but then when women have children, suddenly um, they have long leaves of absences relative to men. They come back to work maybe, but working part-time, men are not. So um, how can we address these imbalances in the distribution between work and care? And how can we really facilitate a better work-life balance? And um, so I think that that would be very interesting to ask from your experiences on the panel. Are you considering work-life balance policies? And also, are you considering how to to really encourage men to, to take more of a role in care? Because that's really critical for women to advance in the workplace. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, a very important question. This is the case, for instance, in Brazil. We have uh, more women in the labor market, more women qualified in the labor market, but less women represented in companies, especially in high uh, uh, jobs uh, amongst companies. One question, who else? Why are you here? Why do you think this, uh, this topic is important? What are your main questions and interests? Anyone else? It can be in French, that's okay. <laughs> okay. One here, one there. No, go ahead. Bonjour, Jacques Perrochat. Jacques Perrochat, General Electric. I'm here because for me, as, uh, uh, it's quite clear that it's necessary to have gender equality, but at a professional level and personal level, I note that this is not true. Um, and it's a fight which we have to lead, we men in this field. So I come to have your ideas. Yeah. Isabel will talk, talk a lot about the He for She initiative, and this is a very also key aspect in this debate, the participation of men in this debate. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Isabel Sebastian. I'm from the Institute for Sustainable Futures in Sydney, Australia. And I'm interested to hear what you think the impact would be if there was gender equality in work and 
in government and in decision making, what impact would that have on sustainable development and the world? Good. One last question here. Donc, euh, moi, je me présente. Euh, Jérémy de Bruyne. I used to be uh, in the Green Party National Commission on Feminism. And actually, I realized that even with, uh, within a party like Europe Ecology Green, there is, an, in a commission which is as strong as it was, there has been sexual aggressions. And uh, therefore, I felt motivated to come de to these workshops today. I could have chosen another workshop, but here it was important for me to come because it is an everyday fight, be it for men and women, for a mutual respect. Thank you. I think we have now elements to start our session. Uh, I'll hand them the floor to Leila. Leila uh, presides the executive board of Vafasalaf, yeah? <laughs> uh, the market leader consumer credit in Morocco. Uh, she was named by Forbes as the top 100 most influential businesswoman in the Arab world for the second time this year. Please, Leila. Bien, bonjour tout le monde. J'ai choisi. Well, I have decided to speak in French because I want to have an impact, and I'm not going to try to find the right word in English or the, the right sentence in English. Well, thank you for your questions because this is the reason why I am here. Morocco is 35 million inhabitants, 51% women, 25% youngsters under 18. A uh, growth rate around 2 and 3 percent because we uh, active women are not very represented, represented less than 25 percent in Morocco. Women has to work, not only. Well, of course, there is this notion of equality, but in Morocco, we can't do without the contribution of women. We need to have women working if we want to have a better growth, 10% unemployment, 30% among the youngsters. So um, this is the context in which uh, uh, I am living. So I am leading the first uh, uh, company of uh, consumption, uh, uh, help to consumption in Morocco. We have had several times the diversity prize because we have a high number of women, but this is uh, uh, in the executive co committee. We have a participation in the, commi the executive committee. Uh, but very often in uh, professions uh, that uh, are not always in the top management. So what I'm asked very often is, uh, what do you do to get to that rate? That's why, first of all, I wanted to give you the uh, figures for uh, Morocco, 51 percent uh, uh, women in Morocco, so of course we should have 51% of women in a company. When you have a candidate, it's a competence. It's not a woman or a man, it's a competence or a skill. When you propose promotions, we do not want uh, uh, she will be pregnant or not. Of course, she will have to stop uh, working. We are very happy to have babies and we have to care for them, but in management you have to take that into account. And uh, I will tell you about uh, some best practices in this field. I'm here to share the best practices which uh, uh, make us an example uh, in the gender policies. But also I come to get your information, your questions, your observations, and what I was uh, struck by was 
because that I was in the previous round table, there were only women in the round table. And as soon as we took talk about women, we have uh, almost only women. And the majority of participants are also women. That's the problem. And I thank you for saying I'm here because I feel involved and I want to contribute. We can't make it without men. Men are at the center of power. They will make it possible to for women to uh, work. And it's through them that we will make it. And when I say men, it's the husband, the father, the brother of a sister, and the son who has a mother. So, uh, so the, the co women's cause, if it's not brought up by uh, men, it will still be a women's discussion. So in, uh, as in uh, 2008, I started uh, making seminars, internal uh, seminars on mixity. Uh, I had platform only with men or with women. It didn't work. The discussions internally were not the same uh, discussions as elsewhere. They're not very were not very challenging. Um, as soon as I had one man on a platform, the discussions were changing. There was some competition, healthy competition, and that's why I decided to mix the teams. And uh, it's a really uh, a leverage because uh, the, the results were better thanks to the, that presence of men. So the seminars I was holding were seminars for all employees, men and women. And gradually, these seminars have been better known. And uh, I was asked to uh, deliver conferences or papers uh, as from March. Uh, day of the Declaration of uh, uh, Women's Rights, we started uh, delivering conferences. And uh, I asked uh, uh, inspiring speakers, men and women, and these people were talking about their curricula. And uh, they, I invited all my partners, uh, students, um, academics. And I was proud to have 60 to 65 percent men. That was the aim. Explain that to men, to uh, make them understand that they are part of the process. They are not a side. We have to make it together. And it's that uh, cycle of conferences that inspired the people I work with. Very often, I organize uh, roundtables where I invite a CEO uh, to share best practices. So of course, there are. There is a frame, framework. The figures are there. Four percent of companies have uh, one uh, manager who is a woman. So we set up, and I remember of uh, um, executive women uh, club, uh, and uh, we try to change that. Very often, people say, I want to promote them, but we don't have any. It, you don't, we don't have it because we don't have them because in the uh, HR strategy, uh, there ha has been no preparation. You can't say overnight men and women would be identical. And uh, they have to have the same skills. Well, yes, but when a woman has to stop working for a few months because uh, she has a baby, she has to come back, she has uh, to be updated. There are some uh, uh, hindrances in addition to the external hindrances. There is uh, social pressure. We were talking about sharing of the tasks. Yes, the sharing of the tasks, because uh, uh, in my company, very often, it's those who make most burnouts are women because they have to manage their job and the children. This is part of the play. And now, as a manager, when you promote someone in the management committee, the person apologizes 
and says, I'm pregnant. She was sure that uh, she would have to uh, wait two more years. I said, first of all, congratulations. It's uh, a gift which we have. And uh, if the person carries on working with commitment, motivation, and uh, if she stops for a few uh, weeks or months, but when she comes back, she will uh, recover her job, she will be even more invested. And uh, then I called her to tell her that uh, she would be part of the executive committee. And uh, I didn't know. but. Uh, I, I said it shouldn't change anything. So, and I, I announced the promotion knowing that three months later she would stop. And what happened? Well, she's been very motivated. She carried out uh, her job remotely from home. I haven't felt her absence because she was so grateful. She was not expected to be grateful, but she was uh, grateful because she had the feeling that it was a favor done to her. So the evolution of women in uh, high responsibility jobs means two things to women as such who has to prove that she has to do more than men. That's true. I am a woman, Arab, Muslim. That's a lot, a lot of cliché. And it's also part of the fact that I go to the forums to say there are other ways to uh, do things. Other presentations in the media, for instance, who sometimes talk too much about some cliché, not enough about others. Women have to do it by themselves. That's clear. It's part of us. If we want to make it, we will make it. And second, we have to go to an enterprise which is open. And if it's not the case, we also have a, 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 a part to play. And uh, we can be uh, a player in change. I was minus seven uh, in that company. After 15 years, I became a CEO. But very often, I had uh, to encourage managers to change the way they looked at us without feeling and presenting ourselves as victims and without having the feeling that uh, uh, when people do something for us, it's a favor. I'm here to answer your questions. I see that there are a lot of youngsters, and uh, I'm very happy. So I prefer to wait and uh, answer your questions to be even more specific in the uh, techniques which I have developed and set in uh, Morocco. Thank you, Leila. Uh, so I'll hand the floor to Bibi. Uh, Bibi is a fashion designer. Uh, he studied at the London College of Fashion, and she created Bibi Productions, a brand that is aimed at uh, bringing Begali crafts under the slogan Fashion for Development. Please, Bibi. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you. Thank you, all the speakers. Uh, well, um, uh, I'm a Bengali girl. I was born in Bangladesh, and then I did my schooling in Bangladesh. Then I wanted to study. You know, if you know the Bengali, if you read the history of during British time, Mughal time, it was part of uh, East Bengal. And Bengal culture is full of art, music. You know, you think of a great Indian uh, Mm, musician, Ravi Shankar, he's a Bengali. Tagore, he's a Bengali. I can tell you, Shatyajit Roy, the film, he's Bengali. So Bengali is full of art and culture. And in 71, we were the part of uh, Pakistan, East Pakistan. But uh, Pakistan, if you see the greater India map during that time, Bangladesh, you know, East Pakistan was here, Pakistan was there. So we had different language, different way of, it's more near to uh, like uh, other countries. So we fought and we got our independent in 71. Bangladesh is one of the few country which made to keep our culture, 
we got our independence. And there is another thing I want to say, because you always hear the misery about Bangladesh flood and this and that. But you all know 21st February is the language day. It is because of Bengalis, Bangladesh, the young boys in university, they fought. And UNESCO declared 21st uh, February is the mother language day for the world. And me being growing, growing up there, I see many things happening, you know. I was with a family, three sister, but I didn't want it to be a doctor, engineer, or something. I wanted to do something. I was very good at art, but I didn't want to uh, study fine art. I wanted to study something which inspired me, because you see, if you all read history, during British time, Mughal period, we made a fabric called muslin, which is in every museum. So it fascinated me how could one meter could go in a matchbox. Why today they are below poverty? So this was something. But I come from a family with something to study fashion, to be a tailor, to go to London. You know, you could be in Cambridge, Oxford, everything. But you know, I want to tell there are so many young generation here. I want to tell everyone growing up is their home first. I had a parents who taught me our culture, our uh, everything. But being in a home, we also know new European culture, you know? So when I went abroad, I never forgot my childhood, you know? A childhood is so important for you. When I went to Europe, people used to say, you come from a country, wow. You know, people are, you are smiling, you are tall. Does one of your parents is not Bengali, you may be in mix. So I used to say, no, both is Bengali, but you can talk. You know Beethoven, you know Bob Marley, you know this, you know. So I used to feel what they think of, you know, that part. Of course, there are, everyone has a bad side, as a good side. You know, Bangladesh is a delta. It's a river. Everywhere you cross from one place to another place, you have to cross a river, you know. And our main transport is boat, <laughs> you know, village people. But of course we have flood. It's like when you have snow, but not everyone is dying, you know. You, you are used to that kind of, we have a lot of natural disaster. So I went to Europe, I studied, but you know, my fashion is, you all maybe, you are all young, you can go through internet in one finger, you can find. Fashion for development, it started in 1996 with the support of UNESCO, who believed on me, that time the Director General, Federico Mayor. You know, UN agency, there is, she's here, she, all you want to do, health education. You know, I'm doing that, giving them sustainable develop income, better livelihood, then the health and education come. So I am doing that. So of course, you, UNESCO, UNDP, UN, all knew I was there, I was going. Because every country is the education. Education is a backbone, and health is very important. But you don't have to be a doctor. The basic education, you could read and read and write. That is very important. So when I finish and when I realized that I would use fashion for development, and it was supported by everyone. You know, they, people think fashion is what brand you buy, how much. But can any of you come here naked? No. You need a piece of cloth to cover your pride, or whatever it is. With that, you are giving sustainable development to something. You know, there is everyone, everyone who work as a designer or craftspeople, they give employed to employment to few people. So I thought of that, and you know, I realized that uh, all the education and everything I had in Europe, I am really was really educated and everything in Europe, I could 
give back to that. There are certain things you can learn, discipline, you know, how the, the colors you shouldn't use, the chemical which is bad. So I went back to my country. Another thing, because you are young, I think young people are the future of the world. I had this dream. I wanted to do something since my childhood. But my dream I did never forgot. One day it was clear to me why I studied fashion, <laughs> what I wanted to do. I went for my dream. It took me 20 years. And today I fulfill my dream coming back. I'm not only working in Bangladesh. I'm working all over the world where they have beautiful <coughs> things, you know, magical fingers. But instead of showing their magic, they're putting their hand, please, from the donor agency, give me money. No. I really respect the human dignity, absolutely. I mean, you cannot imagine what once you earn your money, instead of putting your hand, you don't know how they feel. You know, like sometimes you will see in the villages, if you've ever been to, they go like this. Once they are earning their money, they feel empowerment. They are standing up. You don't have to put your head down for anyone unless you have a respect somewhat. Why do you? You know, our part of the world, that was that. You know, we had British, da, 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 I don't want to go into. You see, they feel. They feel they are contributing towards their family. And you all, I wanted to answer her the first question she said. You know, in Bangladesh and a lot of Asian country, you go through it. We have women leaders, absolutely. We have more than 30 years a woman prime minister. We have speaker woman. We have important ministers woman. You know, and I want to tell you something. My work is with the villagers. I have an office in Dhaka, only one office. I am a self-funded project, very small. But we work, we show the positive things. <laughs> but in my office, because the boys can have to run in a bus or a train to go to north, south, in my office, all the boys work. In the villages, of the, I don't want to bring a village woman who will be uncomfortable in Dhaka with crowded, with traffic. But I'm a woman. See, there is where I'm competing with the man's world. And I make listen. And in my office, uh, someone got married. I want to answer you. And they say, oh, my wife is pregnant. So I have some rules. When the wife is pregnant, I said, you take holidays for these, that, that in Asia, many holidays. I will pay you, full paid. You need, because the kid is yours and your wife's, both. So you get three months paid holiday. And you don't go around. I make sure I will monitor you that you help. This is very important. You ask a very important question because it's a, it's the both parents' duty, and it's changing. It's changing in Asia, but in the village level, mentality is different. Another thing I want to tell you before I close, you all know we have Bangladesh as you buy it from Zara, HMN, everywhere, Primark, oh, name it. Bangladesh is second largest for the garments garment industry, ready-made garment, all these t-shirts and thing, gap you buy, you see made in Bangladesh. Uh, OK, you know with the disaster we had four years ago, Rana Plaza. I have, in my lifetime, I have seen flood and thing. I have never seen a man-made disaster like that. But there are many things I'm against the government people. What they, that's not the Bangladeshi owners also, the foreign brands also, they exploit. But there's one thing the garment industry has done for Bangladesh economy, which is they gave thousands of women who are the village women, didn't have education, all the t-shirts and thing you wear, 
is the 80% made by the women of Bangladesh. So slowly I want to change that so they get better paid and everything because there are no other industry gave so much woman work. You know, Bangladesh has 165 million people. We have 52% women. And you can see in my work, crafts, you know, many crafts. I have the biggest seller of being a designer. I don't know. I have the biggest seller of my Product is my bangles. You will see always I'm wearing. And one is made out of uh, water hyacinth. The plant grows. It's, I was lucky enough for that to promote Queen of Spain. And all people get surprised that how could you make, make bangles out of that? You know that sitting down, six villages come out of poverty that that maybe I'm not if I could I could made it in a big shops and I didn't go back for that if I wanted to do that because I went to a very good college uh, all my work is in archive I am a, a fellow from art university in London and but I wanted to make a fashion for everyone, which is the sustainable, a country I come from where more than 50% live in the villages, you know, and sometimes they come and ask me, can I have a shirt of yours? Of course, I make them the way they can afford. Can you imagine that I see all the young generation wearing my bangles? You know, it's like a jeans you make. Fashion is a culture, it's a necessity. And another thing, you know, that is one word I never like to use is help. You know, people say you go different countries, you help. No, I assist them. I have learned so many different culture. You know, can you imagine? And when you go to the villages or all these things, you will see the, uh, the, the weaving start with the spinning. You know, Mahatma Gandhi's spinning wheel. Spinning is the first step which is done by a woman. So there are women who are doing. But you need, uh, you give us a little bit of time. I think in Europe is <laughs> more conservative than our party is. The, I don't know any countries with the top four leaders are women. If, I, if you know, you let me know, you know. But there are many other countries. India, Rajasthan chief minister is a woman. West Bengal, you all know Calcutta is a very powerful woman, Mamata Banerjee. There is hundreds of names I can do. But you young generation, you know, because you are intelligent, today you can have the digital world. You can make, I believe that you will make the world which we all dream of. Thank you. Thank you, Bibi, for this very inspirational speech. Um, I'll hand the floor now to Isabel Magyar. Uh, she joined UN Women Director's Office in 2017 as a program leader for the He for She movement. And previously, she was uh, the global head of diversity and inclusion, inclusion at Schneider Electric. Please, Isabel. Thank you, Felipe. And uh, once again, Bibi, yeah, it's very inspiring. So. So that's great. So yes, it's nice to meet you. So you recognize my French accent, but I will still be speaking in English because we are in the World Forum. So that's, I think that's uh, that's great moment. Um, yeah, I, of course, um, what I would like to share with you is uh, about the e 4 she movement, but also a key message that's for me and for e 4 she the progress is possible, uh, accelerating the progress is possible. And that's the main message. So it's something I, I would like to share with you, some key achievements. But um, first, because if or she is about engaging the conversation, that's why with Philippe I said, oh, maybe we can ask you uh, why you are here. And once again, I would like to thank all men in the room really joining the session because it's really key, as Leila said, and we will speak about that, of course. But I have one question for you. Uh, maybe uh, Isir, if you can have the microphone. 
uh, what, why do you think that the unity nations, uh, uh, why do you think that for the unity nations is important to address the question of gender equality? Who dare? So, don't be shy. Why do you think it's important for the United Nations to speak about that? No idea? Okay. No, so you have to wait the microphone because otherwise we'll not have the capture. In the Thank you so much. Thank you very much and thank you for being here. It's actually very um, interesting for my colleagues and I to hear your stories. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the United Nations um, has as one of the goals to reach a certain populations out of poverty. And it's been proven that by raising women's standards, they raise their own families. So usually the income that they receive, they you use it in their families. And therefore, uh, you can lift a population out of poverty faster if you target the females in the area. Thank you so much, yes. Other answer in the room? Okay, so, oh there, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, the room is large and we have a lot of people in the room, so that's great. I'll add one on the on the environmental front. Um, it has been proven that actually one of the best ways to reverse global warming um, is to is to invest in girls' education. Um, so yeah. that was uh, discovered by Paul Hawken in the, his new edited book on the the most comprehensive solution to reversing global warming. Yes, yeah, thank you. So yes, so the the answer is first is about human rights. We know that. But there is also two main reasons. So we, we have proved that uh, if we have more women in the governance of countries, we will have more peace, less conflicts. And that's the main, main goal of the United Nations. The second reason is back to the economy. It is proved as well that if we have more women in the economies, we will have more growth and less poverty in the world. And that's also a main goal for the United Nations. So that's why the United Nations are, we are really very uh, involved and committed to achieve gender equality. And that's why also, and uh, for you to know, the, um, the it's Ben Ki-moon, by the way, uh, who has created the United Nations uh, uh, women's, uh, the dedicated entity of the United Nations working on gender equality. And it's the most recent uh, entity from the United Nations created uh, in uh, 2011. That is really important for the story and for the story of e 4 she And then uh, before starting this story, I would like maybe to show the, the video with some uh, image, because he or she is a people movement, and that's why it's important to see image. Thank you. Today, we are launching a campaign called He for She. I am reaching out to you because we need your help. We want to end gender inequality. And to do this, we need everyone involved. Hello 
everybody and welcome. Good afternoon, Facebook fans. We are live from the Facebook offices in central London on International Women's Day. It's got to be your story. It's got to be how you personally can make a difference. The smallest gesture goes such a long way. We are putting the movement in your hands, turning to you to help us create a world in which gender is just a spectrum of beauty and not limitation. the representation of women all across the company, all across the globe, in both technology positions and also in leadership positions. Women actually not only contribute in terms of the participating in the labor force, they drive entrepreneurship. find peace in the world if 50% of the world is women and they're not included in the same conversation. It's actually my letter to her. So he for she. Okay, that's amazing. Yo, it's Lynn, and I have to laugh. How can we need not be equal? We're like half. Like women are like half of the people on earth. And yes, they should have been uh, equal since birth. We believe that students should leave university believing in, striving for, and expecting societies of true equality. And part of this liberation movement requires that we call out and break down these social norms and barriers to our well-being so that we may all be free to be our true selves. There's power in embracing everything we feel. These traits don't make us a man or a woman. They make us human. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, it's a, it's a nice story, and I will start by the beginning. So the beginning of e for she was uh, just after the creation of the United Nations Women. Uh, they, they just think about uh, the past, and the analysis was really clear that the, the progress was not there over decades and decades of discussion, of panels and sessions. And uh, in fact, someone said, OK, but maybe they, there is a reason why the progress are so slow. It's because around the tables, there are only women, women for women. And in fact, we know that in the world, uh, the, uh, the main decisions are made by men, because men are really in command today. So he or she, uh, the, the idea of he or she started there by saying, OK, so the crazy idea to say, if we have one billion men in the world standing up for gender equality, it will be, we, we, it will be so the, really the equal world could really happen. And it was the call for, uh, of Emma Watson. And then, of course, it started like a, really a movement. And for the Unity Nations, and especially women as well, it was really uh, uh, going through the uh, social media and reaching every, everyone on the planet, in India, in everywhere. So it was really amazing. Then the head of he for she my boss, Elizabeth Nayamaro, said, OK, we need to go ahead. We need to, to do more. And we need to transform the world. And it's uh, every day we said, we are transforming the world. And that's the key, wo key word at E4C she team. And the, uh, she said, OK, we need to engage really commitment, not discussion, 
And uh, we have a lot of discussions of CEOs, head of nations, they are blah, blah. Yes, we do support gender equality. And when we have to speak about gender equality, most of the time they are not there. So that's the point. So she said, no, we need to engage, engage. And then she had this um, really nice idea to, to launch the Impact 10 by 10 by 10 initiative. So what, what was the idea? The idea was to, who, so I will say in another way, who is really, who are structuring the society, the societies in the world? We have the nations, because they are addicting laws. We have the universities, because they are educating uh, young generations. And we have the workplace, the corporations. So she said, we need to engage an ecosystem, because it's, of course, holistic. And if we want to accelerate, and that's really about the speed, and stop to say, it, it will take time. So no, stop to really go. And then she said, OK, so we'll engage 10 head of nations, 10, uh, 10 uh, president of universities in the world, and 10 CEOs. And that's why, so um, I was previously a uh, global head of diversity, and I, I was uh, of Schneider Electric. And uh, when the Elizabeth launched that in Davos in 2015, she did a call. So the executive director of Unity Nations uh, did a call and said, OK, you want to join? And to join this story, uh, the requirement was really clear. You have to have three bold commitments in a timeline of five years. So what are your commitments? So concrete commitments. And the, the, the 30 leaders uh, who was, were selected to be part of it were selected on bold commitments. So at, uh, and today we can show already results, uh, even if the timeline, uh, we started the journey in 2015, uh, and the timeline is uh, 2020. So, but now we are able to show that when we have decisions at good level of leadership, things could happen. So, and here we are here for sharing really achievement and best practices. So I have some of, some of them. So I have a, a very small video of Malawi. Uh, but going back to, uh, for instance, for uh, corporations, so at Schneider Electric, for instance, uh, a case that I know very well, the first commitment was to achieve uh, equal pay uh, in three years for 160,000 employees in 110 countries. And end of this year, it will be done. So we are able to show that it's feasible. And when a company said, oh, it's very complex to do that, yes, it is. But when you, you, you take the decision, is it possible? So for instance, another example, PwC, when they started the journey, the, the, the commitment was on increasing the representation of women at leadership level. So they started the, the journey by having 18% of women at the executive committee. And one year after, the number was 47%. So because of decisions. So we can make change. It's about us. It's about making decisions at all levels, individuals one as well, of course. Every day we can make a decision to ensure that we have a gender equal world. So that's, that's really very important. And of course, we are, we are launching a new initiative. So we have now the uh, uh, Justin Trudeau uh, making a commitment on youth. So very proud of that. We have the, 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 um, the World Bank. We have Danone. Danone has uh, announced this year a global parental leave, and not maternity leave again, but parental leave full paid 18 weeks for 100,000 employees in the world, uh, gender neutral, 
What does that mean? That means it's for primary caregiver and second, secondary caregiver for adoption as well. So that's this kind of decisions are possible. So that's really nice to see this, this kind of advancements. At country level, so we have a, a very nice story. The story of, so in uh, the 10 countries, uh, we have uh, Finland, we have Iceland. Iceland has decided to have, uh, by 2022, to have, on, to have only working in Iceland companies uh, committed to gender equality. And they have a label now. So if you, if you are operating in Iceland, you have to conform to this law. So that's really very simple. In Finland, for instance, they have decided to, um, to have a training, a s yes, a training for all the, um, the, uh, um, the um, uh, military service, uh, reaching 80% of uh, young generation, male, principally, so uh, mainly. So that's really what could be done. So for Malawi, so it's really a nice story. But we will start with, with the video. It's very small. Uh, and I will explain to you very shortly um, what's the change management beyond. But once again, it's possible. So can we show the second video, please? I've been inspired by uh, great men like Nelson Mandela, who stood for the rights of a woman. I hate to see a girl suffering. I hate a girl failing to go to school. I hate to see a girl not doing what she can do because I know they've got that great potential in them. In the past, when we talked about gender equality, we thought it was only addressing the issue of a woman. But this time around, we were saying men must also take a stand. Culture can no longer be overly conservative. They've got to change with time and address the issues as they arise. Since becoming a champion, I have addressed a lot of meetings with fellow chiefs. We shall commit ourselves to ensuring that there is equality between men and women, and that there's no gender-based violence, there will be no child abuse, no forced early child marriages. We start believing in that oneness, and everything should be all right. You have to know that he's really, uh, he was uh, at the General Assembly. We did an event this year in September. It's, uh, it's all, always emotional because it's, uh, what he did is uh, phenomenal. So to achieve to, um, to annul uh, 3,500 marriage, it, it took more than uh, one year and a half. And uh, what he is he he's explaining, so it's very short, so you can't see that, but he has to speak to the, to the girls first, then to the husband of the girls. Then he has to speak to the family of the girls and of the, of the husband. Then he has to speak to the uh, chief in the village. So a turn, a turn of conversations. And he did that. The president of Malawi did it. So we have to be committed. So and so it's uh, 
it makes the time to do that. So it's uh, amazing. So it's so inspiring to see when men who have the power of the world today, but also in the day-to-day -day life, because we have the power to change things in our day-to-day -to -day lives. And we can see everywhere we have some also. I encourage you to look at um, YouTube. You have uh, if or she equality stories. We have some uh, Jordan in India said, OK, so he, he, he decided to, to sign the movement, so to go on the website. So, and he said, OK, I need to do something. So he has designed alone a workshop so two hours discussion with some uh, insights so, uh, and, and he has decided to, to go village by village and to engage discussion with men. So and of course India and if you are looking at the website you can see you can click on the countries and see how many people have signed the E for she commitment. And India is uh, one of the, the most. Uh, so France, we need to do more. If we have French people so in the room, so you, we have to be uh, to do it. So that's, that's really, it's starting by uh, each of us. Of course, at, uh, when we are going to the power is, uh, is the best, because we are taking decisions. Another thing I would like to share with you, is, and I was very surprised about that as well, is as I told you in the Impact 10 by 10 initiative, we have 10, we have 10 universities in the world. So we do have Leicester, we do have Georgetown, Stony Brook, Waterloo, uh, Sao Paulo University, South Africa University, uh, Nagoya, uh, Singapore. And because I, um, I was working much more in the corporate world, uh, it was uh, a context that I was less aware. But I just discovered that through this, all these universities, the main issue they share all was about the sexual harassment. And I was so surprised about that because I was just uh, probably a stereotype that probably when people are more educated, we do have less this kind of behaviors, but no. And they did a great, great thing. They, they launched Ideaton uh, through the 10 universities where all students could give uh, ideas uh, to take solution, to, to find solution, because if or she is about funding solution, concrete solution, is really an action tank. Uh, where everyone could be involved. So it's not just, uh, yes, uh, once again, at all level. And it, it was really great to see that, yeah, and with some solution with apps and so on. So very concrete solution to, uh, to, to make the uh, universities and campus very safe. So that's also something we can do. And that's, uh, of course, very... Uh, very positive. And once again, the, um, I did also personally uh, did a lot of workshop in the world with management committees uh, when I was at Schneider. And I, I do recognize, recognize and acknowledge that for men, it's really sometimes it's not easy. But we are waiting for them. We are waiting for them to engage discussion, just to have this conversation and to say, OK, it's a human human discussion. So if we are all equal, so it will be, of course, a better world. So we know that. And everyone, we know that. So that's starting by saying, OK, today, uh, maybe I will do things differently, or just engaging, yes, this conversation with um, a very inclusive uh, I'm sure that you know the difference between diversity and inclusion. Inclusion is how we are buying differences. And once again, when some companies said we will increase the level of women at a leadership level, yes, but do, does, or do the companies uh, really buy the differences? Men and women are not the same. Uh, each of us, we are not the same. But that these differences are so great. And that's something we need to value the differences of each of us. And that's that the inclusion, really. And if we achieve that, we will have, of course, a better world. So that's it was my, uh, my message on my side. And uh, 
So, Felipe, what's the next? We have some time for debate. First, a uh, round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. Uh, I think there are a lot of aspects here for our debate. The question of uh, the application of fundamental rights still, there's still this debate when we talk about gender equality, the fight against poverty, uh, the question of peace and, and less conflict. Uh, but I, I think one aspect that is very important is that we can say that uh, gender equity is really advancing at average all over the world, but still in a very slow pace. So uh, there's an example in Brazil, uh, since 2001, uh, our institute produces and publishes a report on the 500 greatest companies in Brazil uh, related to their uh, gender and racial profile. And since 2001, it has grown but the, pay, the, the participation of women in, in uh, positions of leadership and all over in, in different positions of, of a company. Uh, but still, if we uh, take the representation of women in Brazilian society and apply to a company, it, it, we still would take 100 years for, to have the same distribution as we have in Brazilian society. So, we're getting better, but still is at a very slow pace. So I think the debate is what is needed? Uh, what do we need to really accelerate this pace and the speed of change? Because as everybody said here, we most of people are engaged and most of people are aware of the benefits, but what's the, what's the barriers? What are the main barriers that uh, really um, <laughs> It makes it difficult to speed up the pace of change. So uh, I think we have uh, some time, uh, 25 minutes for, for a debate. It would be great to have more questions from the audience. There. Here in the front. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Erica. Um, I'm also from Brazil. Um, I work uh, for an institute called Consulado da Mulher. Um, I have, I think it's more of a comment and then a suggestion for the he for she movement than a question. <laughs> um, there's one thing you guys didn't mention and I think it's really important to mention when we talk about gender equality is talk about the children and, and how we should start raising our children differently to have a different world in the future. Um, I still don't have kids, I'm planning to, <laughs> but um, I see a lot of people around me now having kids, and I see people raising their kids just like my parents or I was raised. Um, in the meaning of, uh, I don't know, like, a guy, uh, a little guy can do anything and jump over the couch and play soccer and whatever, but the little girl has to cross her legs and sit down and wear a skirt and be nice, be kind. Um, and if we don't, so if we don't look at this, I don't think the world will change. So um, I want you guys to comment a little bit more on, on children if possible. And, and the he for she movement, um, I am engaged uh, engaged in Whirlpool Latin America's uh, committee for women gender equality, um, and um, once we launched the committee, we took uh, the action to sign the WEPS, the Women Empowerment Principle, and talk about he for she for the whole company, and there was a whole a big like communication event and a lot of men engaged in the he for she. What I feel is that um, they signed up, they engaged, but they haven't really taken action. And then my suggestion is maybe uh, the movement could do some call for actions once someone engages, you know? Um, for example, um, I don't know, it's just a stupid idea, but like, email once a month and then do like a call for action saying, oh, if you have a colleague woman uh, or someone who works for you and it's a woman, take, uh, take her to lunch and find out what her fear is. 
uh, to like grow on their, their career. Maybe like once a month you can get something or like get this video on your email and say, this is to inspire you in your action, you know? But I also did my husband sign. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, that's, what, that's why I'm saying, I, I was asking him, um, what did you do after signing? And he's like, I just forgot that I signed, you know? So maybe like if you do call for actions, people will be reminded that they've signed that they can, can do stuff. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. Mm -hmm. So, on maybe education, I will let also react because probably Leila, you have some uh, things to say. Um, and so we have a debate because I had, um, if or she, we we did a, a, a new video, and I would like to show, but uh, there is too 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 much. Um, but I encourage you, it's about a baby, a very emotional one, very nice. And uh, it's, we do not have a, a, a great uh, Wi-Fi there, so I was thinking to show you, but it's, uh, it's too late. So I encourage you to go. It's about bias and stereotypes that we are putting on our children somewhere. Uh, so yes, I do agree. For the signing and after the action, so, yes, I know because uh, when we did launch at Schneider Electric, the movement, today we have uh, 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 almost uh, 40,000 employees in the world signing the movement, so it's huge. Then, of course, the question is when it is an organization, it's really the responsibility of the organization to continue to take this uh, great brand to really educate, to launch the uh, Schneider, I think we did launch the uh, E4She World Cafe, the discussion, the conversation, the actions, and really remind that. Back to what you said, we have now um, a CRM, because E4She is a, is a startup in the United Nations. So we, we have the head of E4She and we are four people. So that's really very short, you know. And so we we did now we have launched the newsletter. So with on the, and of course people who have signed, we are, we have the uh, the email address. And yes, you're right. It's very complicated. So a movement by itself. So the question also, if a movement could uh, be uh, maintained for ten years, for instance, oh, this question we have, you know, it's not easy because a movement should start. The idea is not a top-down, it's a bottom-up also. So how can we encourage local initiatives and not just uh, top-down initiatives, how everyone could be involved and launch ideas and take actions? That's, a, that's not easy to maintain this dynamic. But it's a positive thing, so we need to really encourage people to take that. So one corporation and uh, all people who want, because it's uh, really up to, to people. So maybe for gener for children and education, maybe Leila? Uh, merci. Donc moi deux... Thank you for giving me the floor. I've got two hats. I manage a company, but I'm also at the head of uh, Junior Achievement uh, Worldwide, which is a company which is in favor of the fostering development of jobs for young people in Morocco. We have already trained 100,000 youngsters to uh, entrepreneurship. We start at the age of 14, and we work with those young people. In terms of education, to come back to your comment. I think everybody has uh, something to do about it. We all can contribute. We need to act in both ways. When we organize conferences on uh, women as role models, we uh, talk about education and we also invite the children of our employees to really highlight the uh, priority in education. We need to change the way we educate our kids. And the first people in charge have to do with mothers. They are the ones who have the power to change this. They are the ones who do participate uh, to the education of children mostly. 
And uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship and what I was saying through the organization and through the messages that we impose to people during uh, training courses has to do with uh, respect, respect that young, uh, that young students should have vis-a-vis uh, a girl uh, friend. And I think this is part and parcel of our programs. Why? Because respect starts at birth, in schools, at home. Mothers, parents at home have to send across this message. We talk to mothers. They have a key role to play. Same thing in schools and universities. The teacher remains somebody who is a source of inspiration, and he or she has to send across this type of message, which is not done in practice. We talk about this in roundtables, but when we exit the rooms and seminars, it vanishes. We have to play a part in this. We cannot settle the problems globally. Why? I don't want to be political here. I want to play a role in associations. I'm not an, an elected member, a politician, but we have a role to play in this. If we start this, it will work. This will be a huge movement. It has, so has to uh, be uh, developed in companies. When women work, uh, they have a role to play in this. It starts also at childhood in the Foreign Commerce Association. This year, we shall start organizing creativity workshops that will walk about, talk about gender as early as primary school. This is a pilot study that we're going to start doing in the rural communities. So it has to do with education. It starts at uh, education level. Thank you, Leila. Uh, Merci. More questions there at the back, please. Bonjour. Uh, je pense que je serai plus rapide en français aussi, plus précise possible peut-être, donc je vais y rester en français. Um, C'est aussi un commentaire par rapport à he for she. Um, moi, j'ai l'impression que ça insiste pas beaucoup sur la notion de, enfin, du fait que ça soit aussi positif pour les hommes, en fait, eux-mêmes uh, directement de sortir de ces cadres que la société leur impose, de faire preuve de virilité, enfin tous les clichés aussi associés aux hommes, je pense que ça les enferme aussi et que ça les empêche aussi de s'épanouir pleinement dans la société actuelle. Donc je me demande pourquoi vous insistez pas plus sur ces aspects-là. Just get the other uh, question there and then we back there please. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for the interesting uh, session. My question is for Bibi. Uh, what are the kinds of uh, gender discrimination problems you had when you launched your fashion business in Bangladesh? And what do you, how did you tackle them? Or still if uh, you must uh, be facing still uh, gender equality problems, and how do you tackle them? Should we Thank start you. with Isabel and then Bibi answer? Okay. So yes, it's very interesting what you said because uh, so uh, so about he for she uh, there is a very nice uh, speech from Edgar Ramirez about the masculinity, and I should encourage you to uh, to to watch this video because it's really also about this message. But uh, I have also personal com um, uh, story about that. So. Uh, I did meet a lot of uh, young men working at workplace. And about the leadership model, for instance, we uh, most of companies are encouraging the assertiveness, uh, the, uh, yes, uh, assertiveness, but more than that sometimes. So, and uh, less encourage the uh, leadership participative and uh, really lessening the team and so on. That's more mainly uh, really correlated to uh, to uh, female leadership, and but of, of course men and women could have the same type of leadership, uh, but we do encourage today, I will say in bracket male leadership. And some young men said, uh, I, I I would like just to really manage my team uh, with more participation and so on, so differently. But it's not recognized by my managers. And my fear is that I will not make a career if I'm not conforming to, to that. So it's yes, we 
for for the um, also back to if or she the slow, the the baseline of the art weeks was uh, be uh, free uh, free to be you, and that's for men as well. So it's really how we are not really in uh, putting people in a box, uh, and really have the freedom to be ourselves, whether we are women or whether we are men. So it's really embedded in the message, but of course sometimes it's not. Uh, so, but I got your point, and we can uh, do probably better on that. And uh, but we we do agree for sure. So, Bibi, thank you for the question. Uh, though I was born in Bangladesh, you know, but I stayed out of Bangladesh for a long time. But that doesn't mean I didn't come back. My parents always stayed, but I came back for a holiday. When I went back, because of that question, I'm telling you, first two years, I just went around villages. I saw, because I am a woman too, so go, went around and see, uh, you know, because they are very polite and things. They have respect for me. So when I start to, uh, you must understand everything I do, I leave 99.9% .9 whichever country I am in the out of the city, in the villages. So my work is to make sustainable development in the villages. Whatever we talk about, we want to get poverty out and all this. Every country, even Brazil and all this country, where the people make beautiful things out of the uh, uh, with their hand is all leave out of the thing. Craftspeople, I went back for the craftspeople. I didn't go back to make my garment industry bigger. <laughs> so uh, when I went back and saw the weavers and thing, you know, when you buy a product handloom, it's not the one person work. You are making a sustainable development for the whole family. So family head, I ask, everyone works your sister, your mother, you know, do you give them any money? No, no, they are with the family. I said, why don't you give them money? You know, when you work for me, I give you money. So why don't you share? They, they say you, they don't need to share. But I said, okay. So it took me two years to make them understand. Okay, you give them. When you give like a weaver's wife a money, you know, she doesn't only spend for her. She give, makes sure children have one day maybe meat or fish or for education. You know, they use it for the family. But it took me a long time to make them understand you have to pay your wife. They said, why? She's staying at home, she's cooking. But I said, she's doing the spinning. You know, sometimes she's cooking. But give her the share. That was a problem. It took me two years, but I'm talking about the village people. Everything I do, everything come out of my creation, it's for the village, whether it's India, Latin America. If I wanted to sit in the town and do big things, corporate, I didn't need to go back. I wanted to show the positive images of these people, but that was a very hard work. That was the most difficult work to the male member of the family to convince, give it to your woman member of the family. Thank you. Thank you, Bibi. We still have 10 minutes, so I think a couple of questions uh, there, please, in the middle. Uh, hi, I'm Huang Ying from IDEC Business School, and I have uh, two questions, actually. The first one is for the baby, and I noticed that you arranged your first fashion show in Paris in mm, 1960, uh, uh, 1996, and I think this should be a big step for you, for your business, and I now want to start up my own business also. But I feel it's quite hard um, to start off as a woman than men. So, um, how do you? Like my question here is, how do you find your team at the first time? Like, um, where can you find the financial people, or how do they help you? And my second question is. Um, 
Nowadays, um, when we're looking for some manager position, I think um, we're looking for some qualities like uh, critical thinking, like communication skills, uh, like innovation skills. And those qualities are more easier found on men than women, I personally think. And uh, nowadays, like a lot of uh, famous business women, they are less emotion. I, I feel like they are less emotional. They are feel soft. They are, and they are not as soft than uh, the normal women. So it's kind of like um, my question here is: um, Do we need to? And when the woman wanted to enter the business field, we have to, um, how do you say, we have to give up some quality we born with nature. So, yeah. Very good question. Can I answer the first one? Yes, we'll just take one last one and then I give the floor to you f to wrap up. There's another one back there, please. Okay. Oh. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Theo, I'm from uh, Espoir, which is a, a school uh, here in Lille. Um, I was just uh, wanting to ask you, uh, we've been discussing uh, gender equality in the workplace, um, besides, regu uh, sorry, uh, besides regulations and laws, uh, what would be the concrete measures to just to address the, the problem I in the workplace to make I know just the 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 mentality is change. Yeah, that's that was a job. Um I'm also a student and I wanted to ask uh because as you said, uh think and will change and I'm convinced uh things can change. And I do believe in education and everything. But my question is, um, what could we do as, as, as individuals to change things? Because we don't really feel that we have a power to change things. Uh, we are not big companies, big, co big corporation or association, charities or anything. We're just individuals. And when we face some in, in, uh, inequality, what concrete things can we do apart from saying, oh, it's bad, you shouldn't do that, or we, we don't really feel that we have a power, so what could we do? Good, good questions. So I answered the first one. Where are you from? You're so beautiful, I can't see you so much because light is, a f where are you from? China. China, okay. But you want to start your business in China or in Europe? in uh, France. Okay, I wanted to tell you that I s grew up in London. I studied, I did my career there. But, uh, you know, I told you that I had a dream, you know? <laughs> that is one of my biggest strength. It took me a long time to fulfill my dream, but I never forgot my dream. Today I made it happen. But that dream is to come back and give the support. But also me, I wanted to give you this. Also me, when I came back to Bangladesh, people knew me, Bibi Russell is back. Everyone asked me, you want to make a corporate? You want to make a big garment business? The bank will, they could not believe that I come back and I go around the village, I will make this, you know? So I didn't wait. I didn't make a, proposal, right, or anything. I did a job which I made money. Every, I have two sons. I asked them, do you need that? I gave them good education. You know, your son, you bring them up the way you are. They said, Ma, you do your dream. So I have sold everything. If you think, look at my career. I don't have a home in Europe, nothing. It's not a complaint, nothing more than my dream. So I went back, I put everything, my money, but as soon I came back, after a year, you see that I was lucky enough to be invited by Federico Mayor, Queen of Spain. My first show was in Paris, in headquarter, which every head of state, because what Bibi Russell is going and doing this, at the same time, they invited Professor Yunus, and that time the micro finance was launched in Paris headquarter. So 
You know, people like I dream of Jack Cousteau and all of them, they couldn't believe I could show fashion about. So 29 channels showed it directly, you know? So that was my biggest break. But why if I have the speech of my uh, director general, UNESCO, UN, they don't do fashion, but my one was fashion for development and a sustainable income for uh, village people so they can come out of the poverty and health and education. But I think that if you want that, China, I've been uh, official trip to China. There are so many things, but it is, you know that I still, not even first step in the ladder. When I went back first, I thought the money I earn, I will make whole Bangladesh coming out the village, but it's a peanut. I never sponsor, no one sponsor, but then again, I know if you give me if you think of me, pray for me, give me the strength to continue. But it is difficult in this world to have, you know. But I think China recently, there are so many things, whole world is looking upon China. But could be difficult because now I don't leave the system. But here might be someone. You will have Father Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Bibi. Leila, maybe touch upon the question about yeah. the concrete examples uh, inside a company to overcome this issue. Yeah. Um, the question which has to do with how we could change mindsets is very interesting. When it comes to quality, what type of position do you need? What are the qualities or skills that a woman should have? You think a woman needs to be soft and kind, and, and if you think that men are bound to be uh, managers and chiefs, I think we're not totally wrong, but this is not how we're going to change things. You need to be yourself. You need to have that right doses, and you need to, there's no particular recipe. You need to be yourself, and you need to be a hard worker. A woman, women have changed. In the past, women were almost absent in uh, high executive positions. Things are changing. And over had that period, whether you want it or not, we need to work. We need to be hard workers twice as more hardworking until it happens. And in about 10 or 15 years, once things will be real, we'll move to another step. We have this timeline. We cannot go any faster. And there's something which is very important for me. We need to be aware of and be careful with everything which has to do with making sure that women are going to change just because they're women. Positive discrimination can be negative, and it can be a boomerang effect that could be contrary to the change of mindsets. If you want to change mentalities, why do you want to do so? You want to show what exactly? That while working, while providing an opportunity to women to change and evolve in time, they are as competent as men and they can make it. So what are we, what is the challenge here? The challenge is to say, we want performance, we want to be the best. If we, while including women, which are married full, we can be even more so. Is it difficult to make mentality change? I don't think so. If we respect the rule of meritocracy, if a woman evolves, she needs to be up to expectations. The worst thing would be to say, yes, I was at 10% of women as managers. This year, I have 40% of women in my board of directors. It's great. Look at the step that I've made. It depends how that step was made forward. If, of course, it is based on merit for women, right. If they're not ready, we shouldn't allow them to have access to this. Women, mentalities won't change. Mentalities will only change when we give evidence that, yes, we can do it. It needs to be a win-win. 
partnership, and the company has to win from this. When we talk about men and women in companies, when we talk about uh, equality of genders, it's because we want to make sure that uh, women can contribute in terms of added value, in terms of economics, in terms of our own districts, country, and so forth. According to me, meritocracy is probably the best way forward. It's probably a very strong leverage on the basis of which we can work to make sure that mentalities change. When we face, um, a lady was asking a question, when you face daily some uh, sexual harassment, sexual remarks, when we're not part of the equation, what can we do? I don't know, but according to my experience, I will live in a country where the place of women has to evolve. We still have a lot of progress to make in the right direction to make women more equal. And each time I would uh, be, uh, uh, you know, um, discriminated at work, I was not saying to myself that this is due to the fact I was a woman. I was just saying this is part of, uh, you know, my job and uh, put it aside, you know. Sometimes we over justify this and we say, well, it's because I'm a woman, but I did get the remark. It's if I didn't get that job interview just because I'm a woman, this is the wrong um, way forward. We need to stop thinking that way. This needs to be based on merit. I've never thought, ever, that each time I had an issue at work, this was, this was just because I was a woman. Even if I did get some sexual remarks, I would never stop. Because this would uh, pollute, so to say, or, you know, uh, had a negative impact on myself. If you want to make it, you need to work. You need to be hard working. And everybody needs to be able to make progress and make sure that things do change. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Leila. Please, Isabel. Yes, before, yes, before just uh, back to what you said about the emotion. So something also important to, uh, to say more is uh, women and men are emotions. The way to express the emotion may, might be not the same. So we have to encourage also men, and even at the workplace, to recognize that, because they have emotions. And that's a world with more emotions, and uh, that will be great, so for men and for women. And last, when you, the question about what can we do uh, as individuals, so many, many things. So I was just thinking, uh, Last week in Paris, uh, uh, we, we, did, we did have the Women's Forum and a lot of discussion about the intelligence, arti the artificial intelligence. And we do know that today, the world of tomorrow is designed by people today. Uh, algorithm and a lot of things are uh, really uh, today on, uh, work, we, we are working on it. And unfortunately, we do not have a lot of women joining this. And all about STEM education, so it's, we, are st we have still in the world an issue on that. That means that we know that by designing algorithm today, we might have bias for tomorrow. So it's very, it, it's, it's an individual choice, of course, the career, but it's one things also women can do is to also think that there is many, many opportunities today in the world where women can have an impact, really, not waiting alone, just do something. So something when you think that you can have an impact because we are different. So and that's something uh, we can do. So. It's just also questioning uh, our bias and stereotype, because we have all women, men, and questioning that every day, and even myself, sometimes, oh, Isabel. So we, we need to have this, uh, this in mind. So you have stereotype, I have stereotypes, and we need to really work on it, because it's not an easy job at the end of the day. So. That's uh, and join if or she. So, 
Well, thank you, Bibi. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, all of you.